Um, First and foremost, we're glad you're here. If you're visiting, I see a couple unfamiliar faces this morning. As always, we have a few people online that we don't know as well. We're glad that you're here, and I want to tell you, it's a good time you, you came. We're in the middle of a series, and that's usually not a good thing. It means that we're kind of going somewhere and you missed out. But this morning, it doesn't really mean that because these messages in the Names of God series stand alone. And so we're looking at certain attributes of God, and you can learn about the one today without necessarily having to go back and study the rest of them, but I would just encourage anyone who's missed any of those, uh, Bill said his name is his character, and we want to learn about the character of God. We want to know who he is, and you can go online to do that. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 23. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open that up to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is... The most famous of the Psalms, in fact, if you only have one Psalm memorized, it's probably Psalm 23. And scholars believe that this was David, well we know it was David, but they believe it was at the end of his life. And so he's, he's contemplating his life and he's looking back, he was a shepherd himself, and in the same way that he protected those sheep, what he sees is God has protected him all the days Of his life, and it's quite beautiful and poetic, and I want to read it to you this morning. Says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, you are the good shepherd. You care for your sheep. You lay down your life for the sheep. And God, I just come before you this morning aware that, God, there are some in this room, there are some watching online that we're coming a little beat up this morning, got things going on, don't feel so clean, don't feel like our fleece is all that white this morning. We're struggling in different areas, but God, I, re- I, I just pray that you would remind us that you are the good shepherd. God, in the same way that you ministered to me as I prepared this, I pray that you minister to whoever needs that this morning. And we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. David called him Yahweh Rohi. Yahweh is the name that God gave himself when he explained to Moses who he was in the book of Exodus. Come the 6th century, the Jews no longer really used Yahweh. One thing, they didn't even know how to pronounce it because it didn't have any vowels. It's just Y-H-W-H. So in the 6th century, they said, you know what, we're going to trade that for Adonai. Adonai means my Lord in Hebrew. And then the Middle Ages came, and they said, you know what, if we take the consonants in Yahweh and the vowels in Adonai, we can come up with Jehovah, and, and many of us call him Jehovah today. But however you say it, what it means is the Lord, my shepherd. Very few people in David's day knew God as a shepherd, but David did. God was shepherding from the beginning. When God walked with Adam in the cool of the day, what he was doing was he was shepherding. We rebelled against him and we broke that fellowship, but God's plan was always to restore that. The plan of redemption was one of the father getting his sheep back. In the meantime, he had spiritual leaders that he called to shepherd his people Israel. And in Ezekiel 34, we see very stern warnings to these shepherds who had become corrupt, and they were not caring for the sheep. And God, finally, almost in exasperation in verse 15, said this, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. We're going to look at that idea of lying down here in a minute. But we see Jesus declaring that he was the fulfillment of that promise in John 10, 11, when he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and that's what we are. Psalm 100, verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God. 
It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I got to tell you, sheep need more care than any other class of livestock. They need meticulous care. The idea and the image of God being likened to a shepherd is really beautiful when you think of the care that it takes to take care of sheep. But the idea of us being sheep, well, it's not as flattering. You're never going to see a sheep roll over. They're never going to jump through a hoop. They're never making the circus because they can't be trained. You're never going to see a guy. There's all kinds of cool animals out there, right? But you're never going to see a guy with a sheep tattoo. There's not a college program that has a sheep mascot, right? The, the, the fighting Illini, there, there's a lot of pressure, has been for years, for them to change their name. And if they ever succumb to it, I promise you it will not end up being the fighting sheep. Sheep are stubborn, and they're not the brightest of creatures. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I believe this next video is going to speak volumes. С этой стороны против солнца. So the boy represents God, the sheep represents us. Stop it and let's pray and go home, yes? <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Want means, the primary definition anyway, means not to lack. I shall not be in need. In the same way that the shepherd provides for the sheep, our shepherd provides for us. Last week, Pastor Brian talked about Jehovah Jireh. But there's a secondary definition, and I shall not want. And it has to do with contentment. How many of you know contentment has nothing to do with amount? Adam and Eve in the garden lived in a perfect world. We can't even begin to understand what that would have been like, but they lacked absolutely nothing. They had the direct presence of God, face-to-face -face communion, and yet they became discontent because they thought that somehow the shepherd was holding out on them and they no longer trusted him. I need to tell somebody this morning, though, that in this world, God doesn't give us all he wants or all we want, but he gives us all that we need. If you really believe that, you'll be content. How can I be in want if I serve a God that withholds for me no good thing? As Scripture says, that he doesn't. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I like the King James Version. He maketh me lie down. There are some verses that you just need King James. I was going to read the whole thing in King James, and I thought, I'm going to lose you, so I better not. But this, this word make, maketh, it means to induce or compel. Sheep, like children, sometimes don't want to lay down and take a nap. And so sometimes they need to be made to lie down. All too often we're hurting and we just keep going and we try to rough it out. And, and God says, no, 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 no. There comes a point where I'm going to have to make you rest. I can tell you right now, my wife and I are be at a place where we're being made to lie down. We don't like it. We wouldn't have chosen it. If there was anything in the world I could do to fix what's going on, I would fix it. But it's been made very clear to me that anything I try to do to fix it will only make the situation worse. He's making me lie down. And if you would have told me before this took place a couple of weeks ago that, boy, I would find the pastures green, I would have told you you were crazy. But I, I want to tell you, I'm finding communion with Jesus in this dark place to be really, really sweet. I'm, I'm finding that even when he makes me lie down, they're, they're green pastures. 
I can tell you sheep won't lie down unless they feel safe. David said, in fact, all of the Psalms we read today will be from David. He said, in peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I need to tell somebody this morning, if, if you won't lie down, one of two things are going on. You either question that the shepherd is actually good, or you question his ability to keep you safe. It's one or the other. You, you question his character or his competence. David, again, in Psalm 121, says, He who keeps you will not slumber. How many of you know we can rest because our God never does? I believe a word for somebody this morning is, is stay down. I, I've put you in a, in a place, the Lord would say, and you don't like it and you want out. And I, I just, I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but I just feel this really strong impression that the Lord's just saying, stay down and let me do what I need to do. He leads me beside still waters. Sheep won't go by rushing waters, I learned. I got a sheep education this week. So if the water's rushing, they can't go anywhere near it because they're clumsy and if the water splashes and knocks them over and they end up in the water, their fleece will hold up to 100 pounds and they can't get out. They will drown. So they need still waters. So what the shepherd will do is if necessary, he will dig a trench with his staff and he looks for a lowland where he can fill a pond or divert a stream for them, but they need still waters. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Can I tell you the long and complex history of human beings, of, of earth's religions, of pagan worship, of human philosophy can all be bound up in this insatiable thirst for God. We all have it. It's just where do we look for it? And all too often, it's in that place that Jeremiah talked about, the empty cisterns that can contain no water. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. How many of you know we all need restoration from time to time? I want to show you a picture of sheep in a field. So the one lying on his back there is not doing that to rest, he's doing that because he's been cast, or sometimes called cast down. What it means is he went to lay down like the sheep in the background, and he rolled a little bit too far, and he ended up on his back. That sheep is absolutely helpless, and his circulation will begin to go down, and he can literally die in a couple of hours if it's hot out. If not, he can stay there for a couple of days. But that little sheep that's standing there will never help him. He just looks, and he says, well... Elmer's in a bad spot, but I guess there's more food for me. He's not going to help him ever. He needs the shepherd to come and get him back. Everyone feels the need for restoration. David said it like this, Why are you downcast, O my soul? David undoubtedly was talking about that condition. Psalm 13, David asked God four times in two verses, How long? How long, God? How long will you watch what's happening to me and be silent? How long? How long? Come on, how many of you have asked how long? And you know what? It's okay to ask. Many teach that God is disgusted with his cast-down sheep, but that's not what we see in Jesus. Because all we got to do is look, who did Jesus hang out with? Prostitutes, tax collectors. The good shepherd spent most of his time picking up cast down sheep. I don't know about you, but I find comfort in knowing that I'm supposed to struggle as a sheep. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. The enemy's primary weapon is deceit. He wants to trick us off the path that God has for our lives. If you're traveling today, many of you, maybe most of you, maybe all of you use GPS. I, I, if I know where I'm at, I don't really use it for direction. I just use it to see what traffic's looking like, especially if I'm going into a city and how long it's going to take to get there. And so when we go into Chicago, since I grew up there, 
I, I kind of know where I'm going in, in some areas. And so there's a day about a year ago, I guess, maybe a little longer, my wife and I were going into the city and I was getting off on, I don't remember, let's just say 32nd Street. And at 79th Street, but Siri starts telling me I need to exit. Now, I know it's not probably a healthy thing, but, but I argue with Siri a lot. And so I'm like, no, Siri, I don't need to exit. I lived here. You didn't. I'll get you as to where we need to go. And so we pass 79th Street rerouting, rerouting, redirecting. And then at 67th Street, she does the same thing. And I inform her once again in 59th and so on and so forth until we get up to 32nd Street or wherever we were going. And I look, and it says, exit closed. <laughs> and I get that look from my wife, and you, that, you know the look. I hate that look. And Siri's yelling, rerouting, shut up. <laughs> but how many times, how many times do we do that to God? Come on, the Holy Spirit is leading us on a path, but we know better. We know where we're going. It's going to be okay until we come to that dead end. See, I leaned on my own understanding. But the problem with that is there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it just leads to death. Isaiah tells us that we've all gotten off course. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. It's prophetic. It's speaking of Jesus a long time before Jesus came. All like sheep have gone astray. Even David wandered. But David always found his way back to God's path. And the scary part is sometimes we see believers and they get off and they continue to ignore the rerouting instructions even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me sheep are terrified creatures they're afraid literally of their own shadow and if a jackrabbit jumps out into the field it's been known to cause a stampede among hundreds of sheep they're terrified one of the things they really don't like is the dark I'm going to show you a picture here. And so what you got is, is two mountain peaks, and then you got the valley in the middle. And so this is like two in the afternoon, yet the valley's dark because the mountain's blocking the sun. And so in those circumstances, there's really no danger. The predators are going to come out at night, but, but they're afraid because it's dark. And what they do is they get as close to the shepherd as they can. In fact, it's about the only time he fully has their attention is when it's dark. They gather around him. The reality, though, is that if you've left a mountain and God's bringing you to another mountain, you're not getting there without going through the valley. And the valley can be a hard place. The valley can be a, a difficult place, but what we know is we're never alone. My daughter sent me a, a video link yesterday to a new song by Maverick City, In the Room. I'm just curious, has anybody heard the song In the Room? It's, it's, it's powerful. And it reminded me, there's a book I, I read some time ago, and, and the author said that the awareness of his presence is our best defense against fear. Just like the sheep. The best defense against their fear is to be aware that the shepherd's there and get close to him. Come on, somebody, that's what you need to hear this morning. You're in a dark, scary place, and the Lord's just saying, draw a mirror to me, I have you. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The staff is for keeping the sheep in line. And so if a sheep is wandering, shepherd will tap it to get it back in. It's not to hurt the sheep, it's just to make them aware, get back in line. One of the other things I learned about sheep this week is the shepherd with a very timid sheep, if they're really struggling, he will hold the staff against their body while they walk and it's like an extension of his arm and it comforts them. Then there's the rod. The rod's a weapon. 
The rod is made to fit the shepherd's hand. It is from a tree, very, very hard wood tree, and it goes down by the root system to find the hardest bolus part, and they whittle it to fit the shepherd's hand perfect. And from a little boy, they practice the future shepherds throwing that thing, and they get pretty good at it. They could knock a can off from a far distance away. They have to be good at it because if the predators come, that's what they use. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I was grew up across the street from my grade school as a little boy. We moved when I was nine, but sometime before nine, eight or nine, I uh, would play in the schoolyard, and it was fenced in, so kind of like the sheepfold, if you will. And so we would go inside the fence, me and my friends, and we would play. And the problem was that across the street on the other side, there lived an older kid, and for some reason he didn't like me. I don't even know his name. All I know is he came, he found me, and he pummeled me repeatedly. And so we would play, but we had to keep an eye out because this guy could come at any given time. Made my life scary. feel a whole lot of compassion in this room, by the way. <laughs> so one day my cousin, who was about this kid's age, came to visit. He lived on the other side of town, and he is athletic and really, really good athlete, actually, scholarship athlete. And, and he came and he said, hey, Barry, let's go. Let's go across the street and let's throw the ball around. Yeah, let's do that. And we get out there and I look over. We had these uh, mobile units where we actually had classes and sitting on the mobile stairs is this kid. And I'm like, you know what, Mark, let's just go back. We'll throw it around the yard. And he's like, no, 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 we're playing in the schoolyard. And I'm like, no. And he can see I'm looking at this kid. He says, are you afraid of him? And I said, uh-huh. And he says, he messed with you? Uh-huh. And then before I could get another word out, my cousin went chasing him. And by the time I found him, they were around the school, and my cousin had him in a headlock. And he was punching him in sync with his words. It was really something to see. If you ever mess with my cousin again, it was It was beautiful. I mean, I feel bad for the kid today, but at the time, it was, it was, it was a thing of beauty. I remember my cousin said to me, he, he said, Barry, do you think he's had enough? I said, I don't think he has had enough. And... <laughs> what was that? That was the rod. That was the rod. And sometimes the shepherd has to use the rod. I, I'm convinced that this is what David used when he killed the lion and the bear. I believe that he used the rod to stun them when they came after his sheep, and then he took a knife at close range and finished them off. But this is what I know. Thessalonians 3 says, The Lord is faithful, and he will establish you, and he will guard you against the evil one. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So the word table in several languages, Spanish, in several other um, African languages particularly, uh, the word table is mesa. It, it's a big, open, plateau range. And so what the shepherd would do is he would clear everything off. He would look for poisonous berries and uh, thorn and thistle and all of this. He would clear all of that out so that they can actually be safe and be comfortable because the sheep are afraid. But I love this as it relates to us. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And so the wolves, they want to eat the sheep, but instead, while they go hungry, they're forced to watch the sheep eat. I like that. I don't know about you. God's not going to remove all of your circumstances and all of the people in your life causing you problems, but he can give you peace while you're there. Here's another King James word. My cup runneth over. Come on, how many of you know God doesn't want you to just have enough? I I think Pastor Eric kind of addressed it today, though. It it wasn't just so it can be for our increase in our lifestyle, right? 
Sometimes God, it, it will give us an abundance of joy and peace and yes, resources and other things. Why? Because he wants us to be a blessing. You can't bless somebody if you're living from a place of need. God wants our cup to run over. It's not enough for me to be full. If I'm full, I don't have anything overflowing to give to somebody else. He wants your cup to run over. David goes on, you anoint my head with oil. And so sheep, if they see berries, for example, or something they want to eat, and they put their face in there, and there turns out to be some thorns, it won't stop them. They're just not smart enough to say, that hurts, I better stop. They just go in and then they eat berries and they come out with scratches all over them. And so the oil was for healing, but it had even a bigger purpose. And, and it's this, in the summer, uh, flies come around the sheep and they drive them absolutely up the wall. And what happens is not only they fly around and annoy them, but, but they'll go up into their nose and they'll lay eggs. And if it's bad enough, the sheep literally will commit suicide. They'll jump off the side of the cliff because they can't take it. But all the shepherd has to do is just put a little oil around their nose and that's done. They don't have to worry about it. Come on, in this world, you will have trouble. I can't tell you God will remove every irritation from your life because he won't. But we need the Lord to apply the oil of the Holy Spirit to our mind to guard our hearts and our minds in whatever we're dealing with. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Not, not maybe, not probably. It's a guarantee. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I like to think of myself when I'm walking around that I can't see them, but just back there is, is goodness and mercy. I make a left, they make a left, I make a right. They're going to follow you wherever you may go for the rest of your life. That, that's reassuring, is it not? Cheryl and I were on vacation, and we saw a demonstration from a shepherd. And so there's this Big field, huge field, had to be a half mile long. I don't know what that is in acres, so I'll just talk what I do know. Half a mile, I'll say, by, you know, tenth of a mile wide. And so it went up a hill, and so it was just straight up. And on it were just hundreds and hundreds of sheep. And he had two sheep dogs. I think they were collies. And, and he, so he, he says, the demonstration, he says, watch this. So there's sheep everywhere. They're, they're all over the place. And he says, go. And so the dogs each take one side, they run the fence line, they go all the way to the top, and as they go to the top, the sheep begin to pull in. If the sheep don't pull in, they come and nudge them, they nip at them if they have to, but they get those sheep to come in, and then they go to the top and they bring them all down. And literally within like two minutes in this gate that's not much bigger than this, he has all of those sheep in and protected. It's, it's just amazing. But as I watched it, I thought, if I was that shepherd, those dogs would be named goodness and mercy, <laughs> right? Because that's, that's what they're doing. The shepherd explained that, look, if I call the sheep, most of them will come. If I use a very firm, term, firm tone, almost all of them will come, but I always got that one. And what he'll do is he'll go hide behind a bush somewhere, and I won't know I have him, and by morning he is guaranteed to be dead because that's what the enemy does he looks to isolate and devour someone needs to know this morning you can run from god but goodness and mercy are never going to leave your tail i'm living proof of that and then david wraps it up with this i will dwell in the house of the lord forever so the the psalm opened up with this proud joyous statement the lord is my shepherd and it ends equally with an equally positive affirmation, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, all of God's sheep will spend eternity with him. Someone needs to know that your circumstances are, are temporary, but eternal life is just that, it's eternal. So I just have one question as we wrap it up today, and it's this, is God your shepherd? And I didn't ask, is God your savior? Everybody wants a Savior. I'm asking, is God your shepherd? Because not everyone is willing to follow the shepherd, but the reality is you can't have one without the other. 
This is what Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He didn't say, my sheep read the Bible. My sheep go to church. My sheep put a lot in the offering bucket. My sheep serve in ministry. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. To follow Jesus is to realize that your life is not your own. The Bible says, essentially, that most people in the end times will think they're sheep when they're not sheep. In other words, they claim the name of Christ, but they never really followed him. He said, what's going to happen is that on that day, they're going to approach him and they're going to say, oh, Jesus, you remember we cast out demons in your name and they're going to have actually done it. Come on, how many of you know the name of Jesus will scare a demon out of anybody? But, but they will say, we served, we did miracles, we did all these things. And what's Jesus going to say? Depart from me, why? I never knew you. My, my sheep, they know me and they follow me. If we're not following him, we're not, our, we're not his sheep. Listen, as the under-shepherd of this house, my job is to encourage you, but it's also to warn you. It's also to correct you. But I was thinking about it this week, and I, I really felt like God said, yeah, that's fine and good and it's true, but the main, your main job is to remind them of who they are to me. Look, we're... We're dirty, at times we're stubborn, we're dumb, we're insecure, fearful creatures. That's who we are. But he loves us so much that he died for us. His mercy and his goodness will never stop pursuing you. And I'm going to give you an example as we wrap it up. Robert Robinson was born in 1735. And at the age of 17, he heard a sermon and this sermon convicted him, and he repented of his sin, and he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and he went on the road with the Wesleys. He got into the Methodist movement, and he was powerful. And, and ultimately, he was leading so many people to the Lord that he began to pastor them, and he started a, a big church. At age 22, he wrote, Come thou fount of every blessing. Here, here's the... The lyrics, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it for thy courts above. Well, it turned out that was prophetic because he was prone to wander. And what happened was he got caught up in Unitarianism, which is the belief essentially that there is no holy trinity, that Jesus is not God. He, it, it takes strips him of his deity. And so at age 32, with this belief system, his church threw him out, as they should have. Stripped his ordination. And he went through many, many years down. He believed that God gave up on him. He prayed, but no response. And eventually he just said, Well, for my sin, there's nothing I could do. I'm going to go to hell. One day, shortly before he died, he went to go get into a carriage and didn't realize there was a lady already in the carriage. And she said, no, 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 come on in with me. In the same way in New York City, you might share a cab, they shared a carriage. And they drove and the woman began to talk about Jesus and he thought to himself, I can't get out of this carriage fast enough. And she said, sir, there's this song that it's just ministered to me, and I, I got to share it with you. Do you know it? And this is his response. I'll, I'll read it to you. He said, I wrote that, ma'am, and I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings that I had then. And she, without missing a beat, quoted him to him, Sir, streams of mercy never ceasing. And he repented, got right with God. I believe Yahweh Roe is calling someone home today. Maybe you're wandering. Maybe you've been ignoring your spiritual GPS. Maybe it's been saying direct, redirect and you just keep going your way. I, I want you to go ahead and stand and we're going to close in prayer. And I'm not calling you out individually. I just want to, I just want to, if that's you, I want to pray for you this morning. Father, I just lift up everyone in earshot of my voice this morning, God, both in-house and 
and online. And Father, you know where we're at. You know what life is dealing us right now. You know, some of us brought it upon ourselves and some of us, it's, it's at no fault of our own. It's just part of living in a fallen world. But God, you have us. You are holding us. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Father, right now for that person, for that man, for that woman, for that child, God, I pray that they would feel your love, God, in such an unbelievable way, God, that it will transform them in the same way that young 17-year-old Robert Robinson heard a sermon that transformed his life forever. Somebody, God, with these simple words will have the same testimony. God, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name, all God's kids said, amen.